The heaviest burdens we carry are the thoughts in our head. And so I was going to invite you to empty your head today. <laughs> and, and let's come with empty heads as we, as we worship, as we serve, uh, as we learn together. Talking about the I am's in the Gospel of John. And as we're looking at those, we're finding Jesus revealing himself through those statements in, in such a way that basically he is trying to get us to see all you need is me. You don't need anything else. I'm it. And so I am all that you need. He tells us, for example, I am the water. If you drink of me, I will swamp all your uncertainties and all of your unfulfillments. He tells us I am the bread. If you eat of me, you will have nourishment from the outside to fill the inside from now all the way through eternity. He tells us, I am the light. You can trust me. You can find your joy in me. And the reason is because I perfectly understand you. I understand the struggle with darkness. I comprehend what it means uh, to have flesh working against your desire to walk in the light. Stay in the light. Today we're going to talk about, I've already mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about Jesus as the door. Some translations use the word gate. I want to begin with just kind of a question, I guess, a little quiz going on. The year is 1943, and there is a song that is written and sung by Bing Crosby. The song is written uh, as World War II is happening, and it's actually written from the perspective of a soldier. A military publication called Yank said this, Crosby accomplished more for military morale than anything else of that era. This song quickly became the most requested song on the USO circuit. Everybody wanted this song sung. The song stayed at the top of the charts for 11 weeks, and after 77 years last year, Billboard's Hot 100 still has it listed at number 50. It was his uh, fifth gold record. Question, what is the song? I'll be home for Christmas. Interesting, the Americans found this beneficial to the morale of soldiers. The British wouldn't allow any of their radio stations to play it because they feared exactly the opposite. They feared it would decrease the morale of the British soldiers not being able to be home for holiday. The song begins by telling about a, I'm dreaming of a place I love. And then it ends with, I'll be home for Christmas if only in my dreams. And so here is a World War II soldier hearing this song about the longing for home, knowing that that's not going to be his reality. But he says, it's my dream. It's my dream. That song captured the hearts not only of soldiers, but also of families in America. I mean, it kind of be, almost became a theme song for holidays that those who are away from us want to be here, and we want them here. One of the reasons it was so popular, I believe, was because we all possess a longing for home. We all possess a longing for home. A little mental drill this morning. I told you to empty your head. Now we're going to come back and fill it with some stuff. I want you in your mind to identify the, play, the home place of your dreams. The place of home. When you think home, it's where you go. It's where your dreams go. It's where your mind goes. Now, it could be that when uh, you're processing that, you're going to think about a home where you maybe grew up. But it could also be that you may think of a place where you provided the home for others to grow up. And that may, ha that may be the, the, the home that you, you dream of. And there's a flip side to it. It could be that it's really hard to identify a place of home because you moved often. It could be hard because you really didn't have a home that you would say was a home, that it was pretty miserable. But I want you to process, where's the home that you dream about? 
for the purpose of our discussion this morning, it really does not matter if you have that place located right now in your heart or if you only are imagining what it would be like. It really does not matter because if it's an actual place, then right now your heart has been lightened and you have, you have joy in your face because you're thinking of an actual experience you've had. And if you cannot identify home, I've pointed out to you again what you long for, what you would like to have had, what you wish would have been present. I believe when Jesus said, I am the door, he was saying, I am the place where you go home. I'm going to illustrate with a few actual doors of my history, which are one of my home places. I think I have a, several home places, but, but I, you've heard me talk before, so if you've heard it before, just, well, your mind's emptied already, so you've got to put it back in there. Fedora, South Dakota. So you see the door? That's where this is coming from. Fedora. Okay. There it is. Google's pictures have really become higher quality from their satellites now. So uh, that is Fedora, South Dakota. I've said before, population 75. That's counting everything that breathes. That is it from north to south and east to west. I want to point out a couple doors here. This, this is the Presbyterian Church at the south edge of town. That door right there, I used to go down through that door into the basement. The best ice cream socials in the country were held in the basement of that Presbyterian Church. Then there's the door up here. As a 12-year-old boy, I went through that door to my grandfather's funeral. As a 32-year-old man, I went through that door and preached my grandmother's funeral. You may be wondering why the mail is so late, because this is the Fedora Post Office. <laughs> and it was the Fedora Post Office. There used to be a door right, right there that you would go into, and the daily treks from Grandma and Grandpa's house through the big city of Fedora to the post office. Uh, fond memory of home. Uh, Larson's uh, Grocery could no longer uh, exist as a grocery store, so they decided to feed the animals too. So now it's Larson's Feed and Grocery. Many a time I came through that door with my Hershey chocolate candy bar with almonds. The red building on over here, that's, that was Fox's Hardware <coughs> Store. Grandpa had anything broken, he'd go to the hardware store, find the part or what he needed to make the part, and we would journey to Fox's. Right next to that is the Fedora Hall. I can tell you the very first thing I ever won in my life was in the Fedora Hall, and it was a coconut cake. And I did it because the number 23 was taped to the bottom of my chair. The number 23 was my favorite number long before Michael Jordan. <laughs> right across the street from the Fedora Hall was the Highway 34 Cafe. Used to go in through this door to get the best chocolate malt made in the whole state of South Dakota. And not only did they fill up that glass container, they put the metal one down on the counter. And so when that was gone, you refilled. Went in one time, Grandpa says, you want your malt? I said, no, I don't want a malt today. I just want salt. And at that, I reached into my pocket and pulled out the Bermuda onion I had pulled from his garden. And I said, all I need is a little salt for my onion. And I sat at the, at the counter of the Highway 34 Cafe, peeled the dirt off my onion, sprinkled salt, and ate it like an apple. <laughs> OK, now we've crossed the highway. We're on the north side of Fedora. We're almost through town, actually. This was Grandma and Grandpa's house. Been some changes, obviously, since my day. This is the door right here that they have now uh, built a, a porch around. It used to just be an open porch. It had one of those wooden screen doors. They had a creaking noise that the hinges always made. It was always the same noise. You'd open that door and you'd hear the Ear! And then there was the tension on the spring that was tacked at the top of the door. And you heard that spring stretch itself out and then as you went through the door there'd be this little clunk behind it would come shut with a certain noise 
and you always had the same noise. Now, when the excited little boy was running outside, there was a different noise. Because you didn't just push the door wide enough to get out, you hit the door. And so the hinges made a different sound. It's a different speed. So they made a different sound, the spring made a different sound, and when it came closed, it was a different sound. So there's, there, there's a door, it's got some fond memories. Right through that door was the kitchen and oh, the smells that came out of that kitchen. This was the chicken coop. I put on a leather glove to go get the eggs one day. I was terrified about those chickens pecking my fingers. This is the front door, and the other reason I, I, I show you that is because I don't remember ever using that door. Okay, this, uh, this, this building right here, this, this was Grandpa's shed, and it has a door facing the house, and when you went through that door, you smelled gasoline. Everything he cleaned was with gasoline, and so that's how that, that whole shop smelled like gasoline. There was a lean-to on the back part of that where uh, he kept every item he might need for later. Then there's this, this garage over here, which was the chicken coop. It also had a space where we brought Fosse in to get milked. But then there was this little sliding door, and many a time I was let out of the 54 Chevrolet to grab that sliding door and open it up so Grandpa could drive it in. Doors. Those doors are home. I can't think of those doors without just going, oh, man. Such a great time. You've got places like that in your life. Jesus said, I'm the door home. I'm that place you dream of. I'm that place you long for. When Jesus speaks about being the door, I think he's telling us that he is the door that connects us to our deepest yearnings for home. As such, I think there are a number of things that you and I remember from our home place that Jesus says, this is what my home place is going to be like. It's going to be a place of unconditional love. You're not loved because of what you do. You're be loved because of who you are. And Jesus said, I am the door that will bring you to this home place where it's not about your performance. In actuality, I have accepted you because of your lack of, of performance. I am bringing you into this home because you're trusting me. It's a place of flawless fathering. Oh, to have been a flawless father. Oh, to have been that. Guess what Jesus offers us? A flawless. So any, anything my dad, your dad, your physical dad did that you now find fault with, guess what? Jesus is flawless. How about a completely expert mother? Oh, we have great moms. But Jesus says, I'm... I'm a perfect, perfect mother. You know, and that's why throughout Scripture, there are names for God that are male and female. Because he's a flawless father, he's also an expert mother. I hunted for a word here. Instead of civil rivalry, rivalry imagine benevolent siblings. Jesus says, come in through this door. This is the home I offer. I offer you safety and security. I offer you permanence. I give you roots. I give you comfort. Jesus says, I am the door. These are the things I make available. Jesus is the door to our forever home. He is the door to our forever home. Now we're going to get to John. Let me give just a little background to the text we're going to look at. In John chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples encounter a blind man, and the disciples go with the, the thinking of the day, and they say, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus lets them know that neither of them sinned, but this whole thing is for the glory of God. This whole incident is for the glory of God, and that's key to keep that in mind for when we get to the text we're going to discuss. This is all about the glory of God. So this blind man gets healed by Jesus. He spits in the mud, puts it in the man's eyes, tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and the blind man sees. The Pharisees go ballistic. So they call him in. They're interrogating this guy. This guy's getting the third degree. Who did this? Why did this get done to you? And he doesn't answer him well enough, and so they say, well, let's call for his parents. 
And so they call for the parents, and the parents are brought in. And the parents say, we don't know what's going on. All we know is our son was blind, and now he sees. Get out of here. They call the guy back in. He says, I don't know who did this. But if it wasn't from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. And the Pharisees kick him out. Kick him out. And here's, this, here's the door Jesus. Jesus recognizes that this man's been thrown out. And so Jesus comes to him and he says, do you believe in the son of man? And the man says, who is he? And he says, the one who's speaking to you. And he says, I believe. And the Bible says he worshipped him. He worshipped him. Jesus says, I came, and those who do not see will see, and those who do see will become blind. Glory of God is the whole purpose of this thing. And then we get to this. If you were blind, you wouldn't have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Jesus just called them blind. And the blind man now sees, and the spiritual leaders are blind. And that all sets the stage. Jesus is now going to give two illustrations to prove, to prove the glory of God and what it means to not be blind. I assure you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the door but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't recognize the voice of strangers. Jesus gave them this illustration, but they did not understand what he was telling them. So, Jesus said again, I assure you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in abundance. The first illustration. Jesus uses what at that time was a common communal sheep pen illustration. In city areas, it was common for shepherds who would take their flocks up into the pasture lands to bring them back toward home. Sometimes they would build large pens, and multiple shepherds would put their sheep in that pen. There would be a doorkeeper that would then be in charge of that communal bunch of sheep. The next day... The next morning, the shepherds would come. They would merely call out for their own sheep. And their sheep would come out of that pen at the sound of their voice, and they would follow their individual shepherd. That's the first illustration that Jesus uses. Now, concerning this door, here's what Jesus says. The shepherd is caring for his sheep. The shepherd is caring for his sheep. The shepherd is the one who has brought his sheep into this place of safety. Oh, it's a different doorkeeper. It's probably someone hired to do that. But the shepherd is still the one who has brought the sheep to that safe place. He also then lets them know that the doorkeeper will only open to him. In other words, I am the one who's, who's protecting my sheep. I am providing for my sheep. The doorkeeper doesn't give my sheep to anybody else but me. They are mine. They belong to me. When I come, the sheep hear my voice, and I call them by name. I call them by name. And then he says also that I lead them out. Doesn't push them out. He's not a, a, 
a shepherd dog who is barking at their heels to get them to move. He says, I come, I call their name, and they follow me. They follow me. And then he says, and I go ahead of them. I go ahead of them. The sheep recognize his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but they will run from them. And Jesus gave this illustration, but they did not understand what he was telling them. I want you to go back to the mental exercise. I want you to drudge up that, that home place, the place of dreaming. What Jesus is saying in this illustration as the door, he is the shepherd who provides you your eternal dream home. He cares for you. He's watching over you. That was his first illustration. They didn't get it. So now he's going to get more personal. You see, because it wasn't just communal pens that shepherds used. If you were a shepherd who had to take your flock, and you know that part of the country, it's not like there's luscious green pasture all over. Much of it is up in the hills, and they're eating little tufts of grass that grow from the dew around the rocks. So there may be times when a shepherd has taken his flock so far away that it's more advisable for him to construct his own pen and to have a place to keep his own sheep. And so there may be occasions when a shepherd constructs a pen for his own sheep. And in that case, then there isn't a communal doorkeeper. He literally becomes that door himself. So that now means this about Jesus. He says, I am the door of the sheep. I'm the door. I'm the entrance place to your home. He says, others holding this position are thieves and robbers. There are people out there who don't have the care for you that I have as the door. And anybody else that comes here to come over this or to take my place is a thief or a robber. They're trying to cheat the sheep out of something. Jesus says if you enter by him, there's three things that you will enjoy. Number one is salvation. You'll be saved. Saved from the wolves. You'll be safe from danger. You'll be safe from disease. You'll be safe from all of that because I am the door. I'm the door. But he also says not only are you going to get salvation, you have freedom to come and go. Freedom belongs to the sheep of Jesus' pen. Jesus isn't our, he isn't constraining us. He is giving us freedom. And Paul talks so powerfully about that freedom in the book of Galatians. Jesus says, you enter by me and you have, you're free. You're free. And he even says, there's nutritious pasture and you can, you can come and go. And, and there's going to be always something to feed you. That's what Jesus, as the door, says he's going to do. And then he compares it again. Everyone else trying to provide home for the sheep is guilty of stealing, killing, and destroying because they serve only their self-interest. Anybody else tries to fill this position, they're only interested in themselves. And so they're neglecting the sheep. They're stealing the sheep. They're killing the sheep. As the door, Jesus gives life. But it isn't just life. Translations vary. Give it abundantly. Give it to the full. Exceeding. It's the same word that appears in Ephesians when Paul says that God can do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think through the power that works within us. Exceeding. It has to do with excess. It has to do with having too much. It has to do with, with the measure being more than it needs to be. Jesus says, I am the door to the sheep, and the reason I'm the door is so that I can give them exceeding life. Life without number. Life without measure. Jesus as the door. As the door, Jesus is the only. He's the only voice calling you home. He's the only voice. 
Any other voices not calling to you the place of home, the place you dream about? Satan has a voice too. It's called deception. It's called, Paul even says he disguises himself as an angel of light to share his voice. But that voice doesn't take you home. It doesn't get you there. Jesus is the only voice that calls home. Jesus is the only one leading you home. Did you notice how the shepherd was ahead of the sheep? I go to prepare, what was it we looked at the other Wednesday? Betty Jo, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am you may be also. Jesus is the door into your forever home. To being able to live with those feelings of home. Jesus is the door that gets you there. He's the giver of all freedom. He is the supplier of all pasture. And he is the provider of super abundance. Jesus as the door. Talking about sheep, talking about doors. I just have some passages that just kind of express further Jesus as shepherd and door and how important it is for us to connect with that. Matthew 25, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one, on, one from the other just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left and then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. As shepherd, Jesus is the door to get into the place of beauty and home. But there's going to come a time when he's not going to be that shepherd. He's going to be a judge. And he's going to separate sheep from goats. And those who have come into his home are going to be invited to come into an, an eternal home with him. And those who have not, he will say, depart. You're not part of the fold. That's what Jesus said. Another passage, Luke chapter 13. And someone said to him, Lord... Are there just a few who are going to be saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open, it, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I don't know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And he said to them, I tell you, I don't know you. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when they see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets. Jesus says, I'm the way home. I'm the way home. And there are going to be people crying out that they're sheep, that they're part of Jesus' fold, that they're in his pen, that they, they, they need to get in. And Jesus says, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're from. Remember, remember John 10? The sheep hear my voice. I call them by name. And they follow me when they hear me. And Jesus said, I don't know you. I don't know you. So depart from me. And part of the punishment is going to be being able to see those who did obey God. And then, of course, in the book of Revelation... Jesus said, I stand at the door and I knock. And anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and have dinner with him and he with me. The victor, I will give him the right to sit with me on my throne just as I also won the victory and sat down at my father's throne. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus is the door. <laughs> and the mental imagery is Jesus stands at the door of your house and he knocks and he says, you need to open to me the door. 
And if you do that, I will come in and we will be one together. You will be my sheep and I will be your shepherd. I will be your forever home. I'll be the place you imagine, you dream of when you think of what home is going to be. I am the door. Are you walking through that door today? Is Jesus your eternal home? And if he is, and it makes Fedora look like Podunk City to have God fixing me an eternal home. And oh, what a place that'll be. If you're prepared for that place, then rejoice in that today. And if you're not prepared, what do you need to do to get that way? If you've never become a child of God, allow your belief to move you to the point of repentance and confession of Jesus to die to yourself in baptism and bury the old man to be raised to walk in newness of life, to be faithful then to him, to walk with him as a shepherd, to live in his pen as long as we have life. And if we do that, we will be at home with him for eternity. But it is possible for us to have begun that journey and then to have departed that to step out of that, to come back to listening to robbers, to falsehood, to deceivers who are calling us to believe things that the shepherd, the door, the gate doesn't want us to believe. 